You been rocking with the show? Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. It's crazy how it all come together, though, right? Yeah. Sitting right there. But you, you was on. You was on set a lot. You ain't wanna play in that. You ain't. You ain't play that. You ain't get no. Uh, for real. Yo, yo. Okay. 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 Is that what? Is that what they say? <laughs> I ain't turning. I ain't turning nothing up. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to Politics and Pros at Union Market. I'm Morgan, the an event manager here with the store, um, and we thank you all for being here with us. Uh, we have plenty of events like the one we're having today here and at our Connecticut Avenue store. You can. Um, Check those out at politics-pros.com. We also offer uh, trips, classes, and book groups. Uh, before we get started today, I would like to ask you all to please silence your cell phones for the event. Um, and we will be having a Q&A during the event today, so I will be around with this wireless mic, and you can just raise your hand during the Q&A, and I will pass it to you. Um, thank you all for complying with our mask policy. We just reinstated it due to the rising cases in DC and we just ask that you keep it on throughout the event. And once the event is complete, we ask that you um, just help us by folding up your chair so we can reset the room pretty quickly. All right, so this evening I am excited to Welcome uh, D. Watkins, celebrating the release of Black Boy Smile, a memoir in moments. D. Watkins is the New York Times bestselling and award-winning author for, of The B-Side, The Cook-Up, Where Tomorrows Aren't Promised, and We Speak for Ourselves, which was one book, one Baltimore selection. He is an editor-at-large for Salon. He is featured in the HBO documentary, The Slow Hustle, and is a writer on We Own the City, an HBO miniseries from David Simon. His work has been published in the New York Times, New York Times Magazine, The Guardian, Rolling Stone, and other publications. He is a college lecturer in the University of at the University of Baltimore and holds a master's in education from Johns Hopkins University and an MFA in creative writing from the University of Baltimore. Watkins Awards includes the BME Genius Grant for Dynamic Black Leaders, the City Limit Dombach Award for Service to the Literary Arts, the Maryland Library Association, William Wilson Maryland Author Award, and the Ford's Men of Courage Award for Black Male Storytellers. He was also a finalist for a 2016 Hurston Wright Legacy Award, and The Cookup was a 2017 Books for a Better Life finalist. He lives in Baltimore, Maryland with his wife and daughter. Um, we will also be joined by April Ryan, who we will be in conversation with. She's just running a little bit behind. Um, but I'm still gonna go ahead and read her bio so we all can be reminded of who she is. Well, when she comes, I know you all don't need necessarily an introduction, but he will be in conversation with White House correspondent April Ryan who has a unique vantage point as the only black female reporter covering urban issues from the White House, a position she has held for 25 years since the Clinton era. 
Her position as a White House correspondent has afforded her an unusual insight into racial sensitivities, sensitivities issues, and, att and attendant political struggles for our nation's past president. April can be seen almost daily on CNN as a political analyst. She is also the Washington, D.C. Bureau Chief on The Grio. She has been featured in Essence, Vogue, Cosmopolitan, Cosmopolitan, I'm sorry, and Elle magazines, to name a few. April Ryan has served on the board of prestigious White House Correspondents Association. She is one of the only three African Americans in the association's over 100 year history to serve on the board. She is also an esteemed member of the National Press Club. In 2015, Ms. Ryan won, was nominated for an NAACP Image Award for her first book. In 2016, National Council of Negro Women, Mary McCall, Mary McLeod Bethune Trailblazer. And in 2019, April Ryan became an honorary member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and was recognized as a 29th <laughs> Freedom of the Press Award winner by the Reporters Committee for the Freedom of the Press. April was nominated in 2021 with the NAACP Image Award for Social Justice Impact. April is a Baltimore native and Morgan State University graduate and she gives back to this community by serving as a mentor to aspiring journalists and assisting with developing up and coming broadcasters. April considers her greater life work, raising her two daughters who are phenomenal young women. April is the author of award-winning book, The Presidency in Black and White, At Mama's Knee, Mothers and Race in Black and White, where she looks at race relations through lessons and wisdoms that mothers have given their children. Her latest book is Under Fire, reporting from the front lines of the Trump White House, and her newest book, Black Women Will Save the World, an anthem will be out in this October. Please give our guests a round of applause. Uh, no, you don't have to clap. You don't have to clap. I, so I, I, oh, just, just for you, thank, thank you. I apologize. I did not know you had a long version of my bio. I hate it. I always go, well, he's a writer with people related to him in Baltimore, the end. Like, I don't like all that stuff because it just takes long. And, I, you know, it doesn't make anyone feel any more special. So I, I, I can't apologize for April's long bio. <laughs> but I apologize for mine. It was a lot. Sorry. Um, thank you guys for coming out. Um, this is this is new. This is different. I haven't really had a chance to to workshop this or to read a lot of this stuff aloud. So this is like a sample. Um, I don't know what it feels like, so I'm just I'm just gonna get right into it. Um, I will say that the book has um, it's broken down. It's broken down into six books, but it's mainly three moments. Um, it's the moments where I learned from the people I was raised um, what being a man is, um, where I unlearned it, um, and my happy ending that is being constructed every day, right? So we don't want to act like a happy ending is like, uh, you know, a tweet or like, <laughs> you know, like a, a photo op for television or something like that. It's something that you work at constantly every day. So. It gets dark, trust me, it gradually gets lighter. Um, you, you'll, be, you'll be okay. You good? All right, cool, let's see what this feels like. Um, in advance, excuse my language, it's cool. There's no children, right? Nobody hiding a kid. <laughs> Who was hiding the sun, Drake? Nobody, nobody hiding the sun, right? <laughs> Child. You ain't have pussy since pussy had you. My camp counselor, heavy, breathed into my ear, squeezing my nine-year-old shoulders and pushing me through the cabin door into a dim lit room. Don't come out until she tell you to come out. I slowly stepped forward into the room. A song I heard too many times at block parties and cookouts whispered out of a small black and gray plastic radio with the wire hanger antenna sitting on the dresser. Back to life, back to reality, back to here and now. Boy, stop looking all stupid and close the door. A raspy voice shouted over the music. 
lock it. I follow her directions without facing her, holding the thin door, wiggling it shut, latching it. And then I stood there, paralyzed, waiting for another order. She, dr she brushed past me on her way to the bed, bumping my shoulder. Finally, I saw her. She was a woman, but about my height. Her thighs thicker than my torso. Her odor like sweat. Won't you sit down, she asked, looking at me. I looked away. What cabin you in? She was brown, almond, and again, I noticed that she was a woman, not a girl, double my size and age, I thought. Her big white teeth poked out when she spoke, half of them separated by gaps so large that I could probably fit my thumb in between. She was wearing a loud neon pink tennis skirt that floated above her upper thighs. She sat with her legs wide open in front of me. 1315, I responded. The older guys, the ones who hung at the top of my block, they love women. They laughed with them, drove them places, showed off the things they bought for them. They fought with them and told the women they loved them. I don't love this lady. I don't want to do anything for this lady. She's a stranger. Oh, okay, well, how old is you, boy? You look like a little baby, she said, with one eyebrow raised. I'm nine and a half, I replied, looking away. She laughed so hard, a mist of spit sprayed from her mouth. Holding her stomach, she laughed some more. East chuckle, carrying her head up and down in a rapture, with her long cleaveless jig jiggling in waves with each movement. Yeah, okay, boy. I know your big ass self is older than that. Come here, she ordered. My heart sank to my feet. Beads of sweat stretched across my forehead and drizzled down the side of my face. My shoes felt like 50, no, 75 pound weights. I trudged toward her. Nine and a half, she laughed. Boy, you silly. Stood about a foot away from her as she started to pull me toward her. I felt myself being sucked deep into her world, a world of stickiness. She smelled like Ashland Avenue, or what my grandma meant when she said, when she put her face close to mine and said, you smell like outside, go wash up. She stuck her hands up the bottom of my basketball shorts and touched me. I looked away. I wanted her to stop, or did I? I felt as bad as the room smelled, as bad as she smelled like chewing gum and eggs. Crickets screamed through the window as blood rushed into my fingers, my toes, and every other part of my body. The older dudes from the top of my block. I thought of them. They pin her to the bed, flesh thirsty, fearless. They rip her panties off with their teeth and dive in. They talked about it all of the time, every day. I was their little brother. I was supposed to be like them. So why am I scared? Why isn't she scared? The older dudes from the top of my block, they'd always joke that one day it'd be my turn to taste it, to touch it, to dip my head in the devil's ass, they say. I never imagined it like this with a girl I didn't know who was older, a girl who was not my girlfriend, a girl I never had a crush on, a girl I never wrote notes to or drew pictures for, a girl who smelled like outside. She rubbed me, and for the first time, I was being touched. It was strange because hugs and kisses and I love yous and I love yous at home were rarely traded, if ever at all. Now, the only thing separating me from this stranger was my fear. So I'm gonna jump to a later part in the book. Um, that it, it gets dark, but it, it, it gets light and everything is fine, I'm good. I pay my bills and I went to college and you know, all these other things. So like, Everybody safe. I got this section in my phone because I had to condense some of it. It was kind of long and I wanted to capture all the points, but it's all, it's all in the book. I just had to jump around a little bit. I'm about to be someone's dad and it's scary. My wife has a permanent smile. Even on bad days, she still cheeses. On good days, her smile expands so much that her nostrils flare and her eyes disappear, and you can see each and every tooth in her mouth, even the theramole is tucked all the way in the back. I've been getting the expanded version of her smile a lot lately, as I've been doing all of the things good husbands do. Listening, opening doors, dinner dates, just because Fly was at work, more dinner dates, and watching Lifetime movies without complaining, 
even though the plot is always the same. Some creepy white man raising havoc on some lady who triumphs in the end. So when she walked into my little makeshift office slash sneaking room and stood in front of the TV, struggling to hold up that eight pound smile, the only thing that came to mind was, oh shit, why am I so good at romance? What great thing did I do now? Baby, she said, I am, we are, we are pregnant. I leaped up and wrapped my arms around her as she cried tears of joy, professed her happiness, and probably said some memorable things I should have been listening to. However, I didn't really hear anything after we are pregnant. Not because I get weirded out when couples say we are pregnant as if men have to deal with swollen feet, picking up the extra pounds and having to mentally prepare themselves to push out a small breathing human. No, I didn't hear anything because we don't have any children and it's scary. We weren't aggressively planning kids. Even though I was on the wrong side of 30 and she was well on her way, we knew that, me we knew that meant the window was closing soon. And if it happened, we both felt like we'd, we'd be beyond proud. We are. And we promised to tirelessly work at creating a dreamlike reality where we are those revolutionary, loving, and caring, but still open, fun parents. The parents, the parents you want to hang with, the parents you try to dress like, the parents your friends would want to hang with, the parents that made broccoli cool, the parents that made everything cool, the parents that would make all of the other parents jealous. Before we were expecting, my wife and I would ambitiously joke about this over half-eaten plates of food, empty red wine stained glasses, and go on and on and on and on and on because we knew that if we had kids, we'd be the parents that could bring, that they could bring any and every issue to. The parents you brag about, the parents who baby or toddler or teenager had zero effects on the romance, the parents who would never have disagreements with their children. It's funny how people without children are experts on parenting and always have the best advice. Now, my wife and I have to try to be those impossible people. Before the baby, I was Dee Watkins who was never leaving East Baltimore. It was in my bio. Don't get me wrong, I wasn't living in the trenches or public housing. However, I was close enough, maybe a $4.27 Uber ride away from the chaos and drama where I grew up. I was close enough to keep tabs on everything happening from who got shot and who got locked up to who was coming home after a 10 year stretch, but far enough to take sanity breaks when needed. The day my wife carried her smile into that room to tell me that she was having a baby was the same day I started looking for houses with the yards in a safer East Baltimore neighborhood. I don't even know why I care about yards. I never had one, but it seems like good parents buy their kids a yard. The day I found out my wife was pregnant, I decided that my son would have a nice yard in the safest East Baltimore neighborhood. So I found out we were having a daughter, and safe in America seemed like an oxymoron. I want to raise my girl in Mars. But we settled on a home in a gated community in North Baltimore, a place where doctors and lawyers like my wife and other journalists and professors like myself settle. It's the safest place I ever lived in. Price below the amount we planned on spending, even before I found out my son was a girl, and still, it's scary. Daughters are the best. My friend said, you are going to have so much fun. Congrats on your new best friend. Don't let her wrap you around your finger. Daughters are terrible, my other friend said. She's going to work your last nerve. Swap her from somebody's son at the hospital. People do it all of the time. Jokes aside, I honestly didn't care if it was a boy or a girl, just a healthy baby with her mom's smarts and smile, cocktail with my sense of humor, but mainly healthy. I really only care about healthy, and that anxiety brings more fear. Knowing that black women are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes due to poverty and lack of paternal care is scary. Knowing that we'll be welcoming her into America, a place that is overwhelmingly racist and sexist, and she will have to learn to survive both is scary. Scary because black, men are, black women are paid 61 cents for every dollar paid to white men. Scary because no matter how talented Resilient and strong black women are, they still are underrepresented in leadership positions across the country, represent almost half the low-wage workers, and are two times more likely to go to prison than white women who commit the same crimes. And then it's the stuff that doesn't make it in the studies. The number of places that outlaw braids and locks, like Christ the King Parish School in Louisiana, who asked Faith Fetley to leave because of her extensions in 2018, or the greater number of black girls sent home for wearing their natural hair 
in its natural state. California just legalized Negro hair in 2020. Can you believe that shit? And then there's the gross representation of African Americans in contemporary literature and the lack of black princesses in children's books. Imagine the excitement a little, girl, a little girl fills up with the first time she is introduced to an idea of a beautiful princess. Now imagine how that excitement grows when you tell her that she is a beautiful princess and deserves to be treated as such. And then what happens to that excitement when you take her to the library or shopping for books when, she confronted, when she's confronted by dozens of stories about beautiful princesses, but none of them has a nose that looks like hers. None of them has hair like hers the same texture as hers. They don't have skin the same color as hers. I'll have to explain that to my daughter one day as well, and it's scary. I once Googled beauty and click images only to see pages and pages of blonde white women all over the screen. I'll have to explain that as well. Seems like raising a black girl requires the explaining of a lot of things that you should not have to explain. My wife, who was politically connected in a maven and I, of raising our daughter in Baltimore, and that's scary. Scary because we know everybody, the mayor, most of the city council members, teachers, gangsters, gang members, pastors, other elected officials, pimps, the cast of The Wire, squeegee boys, drug lords, award-winning chefs, the law, and the whole art community. Will she even get a chance to create her own legacy or be forced to ride the accumulative privilege that we have already created? Is giving her the world the goal, or should we be teaching her the power of the lessons that come with failure as we both experienced our fair share. We know the best lessons come from failure. However, the idea of her feeling pain, a pain that we could make sure she avoids, is scary. I know in Baltimore one day somebody is gonna recognize her last name and tell her something like, your father is an amazing person. He deserves the world. He donated copies of his books to my school. We read them front to back twice over, and he visited us multiple times, funded pizza parties, and passed out gift cards. He is the first author we ever met. He taught us the power of critical thinking and is the reason why I decided to become a writer. He not only told me, he showed me that I can do it, but he also helped me start my career. I love D. Watkins. He's the best. I know in Baltimore, one day somebody is going gonna, is gonna to recognize her last name, and tell her something like, your father is a terrible person. He doesn't deserve anything. He and his friends stole drugs in front of my grandma's house. He's selfish. They robbed, they stole, they destroyed the neighborhood. I hate D. Watkins. He's the worst. And both of those people will be absolutely right. I deserve both everything and nothing at all. And I'm going to have to explain that. I'm going to have to explain to her that nobody is just one thing. People are complex, walking contradictions, especially me, and my backstory comes with an immense amount of healing and pain. Maybe she'll want to see or even attend that school that I gave those books to, and that's scary. Maybe she'll want to visit the neighborhood and carve out her own identity there, which is even more scary, but shouldn't I be encouraging her to inhabit the places I fought and currently fighting to make better? Wouldn't I be a phony if I tried to keep her away from guys like me? the ones who switched the negative to positive but chose to remain in the fire. By moving, am I even still in the fire? For now, deciding to not decide is the decision. My wife was carrying well, she's healthy, active, and I'm trying to be the best husband I can be. Late night store runs, making sure she takes those prenatals, happily watching terrible television, and maintaining a romance the best way I know how. I'm gonna read one, read one more so we got time. April not here, right? Yeah. So. All right. So this is a year after she was actually born. She actually made it through the pregnancy. Um, we were driving down the street, and Karan went into labor, and then I had to park the car, and I got I poured like a gurney out of my trunk, and then I had oxygen in the glove box, and I took it out, and I delivered the baby, and there was another person having a baby on the other side of the street, so I helped them too. So I ended up, you know, bringing the kids into the world at the same time. No, none, none of that, none of that, none of that happened. That would be great, right? Wouldn't that be great if, like, I went to deliver a kid and then delivered like three of them, and then like, still went to the bar. <laughs> you know what, baby? I say to one-year-old cross, my daughter's cross. Men who aren't married don't vote and are more likely to get gum disease because they don't have wives who make them vote and go to the dentist. That's what you. That's what, your mom do, that's what your mom does to me. <laughs> Before your mom, I didn't vote or have gums in my mouth. 
Cross, who looks just like a mini version of Karan, answers with her mother's smile, eat, eat, or stinky, showing all six of her little white teeth. Or she just cackles at my theories of randomness, stomping both feet to the tune of the historical laugh that she inherited from both of us. I'm feeding her bananas mixed with avocado, or what we called avocado buyao, or I'm changing her. Either way, the conversation continues. Trump's election killed the post office. I swear we mailed the neighbor a Christmas card and she didn't receive it until Valentine's Day. And the mail lady has a small head. Cross, please, please never trust people with small heads. Promise me you'll stay away from them. Stinky, Cross laughs. When Karan leaves the baby and me to our own little world, I take the opportunity to disobey the meticulous feeding, bathing, TV, and reading schedule she's created for no reason other than showing Cross I'm the cool parent. Daddy, can I brush my teeth with ice cream? Yes. Daddy, can I set your Nikes on fire? Yes. Daddy, can I have two ponies? You can have six. Yes, 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 yes. The answer is always an enthusiastic yes. You know you should never trust a person named after a city or state. I once knew a guy named Montana who bought a round of drinks for like 10 people, then he went to the bathroom and never came back. I tell Cross, digging through her food options. So your mom wants you to eat this whipped up spinach and potato stuff, but we can save that for when you guys hang out. Then I pull out some grapes and blueberries, build a neat pile in front of her, and together we devour them, jamming smash piles into our talking holes. When I first found out, your mom was having a squealer in her belly. That's you, Cross. You are the squealer, I tell her. I was super nervous, but now you're so great, you make this parenting stuff easy. Eat, eat, Cross replies. When we finish the berries and grapes, we split a huge plate-sized chocolate chunk cookie. A quarter of that cookie probably holds enough sugar to shoot her small body through the roof. So I give her half of it because I want my baby aiming for the moon. Breakfast is as important as oxygen. I say, breaking off pieces of the cookie for her. Lunch is a really stupid meal. When you get older, you can skip lunch for the rest of your life. I haven't had lunch since 1988, and I don't miss it at all. Cross signals for more cookies, and of course, I give her the whole thing. I'll give her another one, too. Once we're both loaded on enough sugar to start a refinery, I blast the Sonos to the highest level. I don't play mom's curated playlist of church jams. Instead, we dance offbeat to the clean versions of Tupac, her, Jay-Z, Rihanna, NBA Youngboy, Prince, Shaka Khan, Rick James, Drake, Tiana Taylor, Aretha Franklin, Nas, and Mary J's My Life, My Life, My Life, until we wear ourselves out. Then I let her watch too much Sesame Street, so much Sesame Street, hours of Sesame Street, back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back episodes of Big Bird, Big Bird, Abby, Cookie Monster, and Mr. Noodle. Who in the fuck is Mr. Noodle? Never ever be like Oscar the Grouch, I tell her. He's a hater. He's always mad. And he stinks. Stinky, she cries. Yes, baby. Oscar stinks. Stinky. Cross loves that I let her binge Sesame Street so much that she runs over and gives me, a big, and gives me big hugs in between segments before running back to the iPad to prepare for Elmo's happy, happy dance, dance. And it is in these moments full of the smallest but sweetest affection that I realize how much I really love her. Hey, Cross, I love you, I tell her, after one of those hugs. But I don't want you to think that I just love kids. I actually don't like anyone else's kids. If you never, ever, ever see me hugging someone else's child, I only love you. She runs over and gives me another big hug. After binging a month's worth of Sesame Street in a couple of hours, we spend some time throwing things from one side of the living room to the other. I don't know what she can learn from this exercise, but I feel like every baby needs to learn to throw. Tossing Legos, Snoopy, slamming the American Girl doll is a, is a great way to burn time while I figure out where in the world we're going to go because we can't just sit in the house. I like to put her in whatever types of Jordans or Air Max or Barclays I'm wearing that day. This is our thing. The same shoes I chase and captured my whole life have, have all been resurrected into cute little baby versions for her. We jump in the truck and cruise up and down the small blocks that make up my city, her city. Then I roll near the block where I grew up. As we drive, we slowly pass the neighborhood where my friends would pedal bikes through the streets all summer, where we got into fights, where we sold frozen cups, where we, excuse me, enjoyed our youth. 
Frost's present in this place scares me, but I tell her, this is where your daddy is from, and I'll tell you all about this place when you get older. She looks out of her window as if she knows what I'm talking about, and maybe she does, maybe she feels it. I tell her all about her history. I show off the old homes and tell her how all of this will be different when she's old enough to drive. Are you gonna drive me around when you grow up? I ask in the rear view mirror, but my antics have put her to sleep. That's the nap her mom scheduled. When we get home, I quickly try to wash our day off, give her some vegetables, and get her ready for bed so that her mother can relax once she's home. We'll still wait for her for the final tuck-in. While we wait, I read across a book. Mary had a little glam or hair love, and I tell her I'm so happy to be your father, and I will cherish these days and the days to come for the rest of my life, always pulling up for you, for any and everything, and I don't care if that means I have to sit my big self at a tiny table to join your tea party or let you paint my nails during spa day, even though I hate the way nail polish smells, or buy you a puppy and help you raise it. I will proudly adjust to the change of you picking out my clothes and sneakers instead of me picking out yours and a dreaded drive we will take to the movies on your first date. I'll proudly celebrate all of your wins while being there to coach you through all of your losses. Whatever it is, I'm there. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else in the world. We smile, and at the end of my monologue, Karan pulls up into the driveway and rushes back into the house just to finish putting Cross to bed. But it's too late because the schedule she created works too well, even when I don't follow it, and the baby is already knocked out. But I notice I'm not the only one who breaks the rules because Karan makes a little too much noise purposely or invents some reason to go into Cross's room just to wake the baby up to see her one last time and give her a good night kiss. Thank you. <laughs> it's funny reading this because, it's funny reading this because she don't do none of this stuff no more. She don't eat spinach and potatoes. She don't fuck with Sesame Street. Like, <laughs> like, she don't even, like, I mean, when she's on the iPad, she's like on all the learning games. So it's just kind of like not, like it's, it's not the same. And they change so fast that I don't even have a truck anymore. I drive a car now. Like. <laughs> don't write nonfiction because none of it will be true <laughs> by the time the publishing company um, put the book puts out the book um, so let's skip to some audience questions who has a yeah, question let's get into it because it's 737 yep. I was wondering in that first part that you read uh, with the lady how old were you nine and how old was she it had to be like early 20s. Okay, so this question may not have an answer, but I've heard a lot of black men, and I'm saying black men because that's all I talk to is black men, talk about sexual experiences they've had young with grown women. And they talk about it like a badge of honor, right? When you try to explain to them, that's molestation. Like you were a kid, she's a grown woman. There's a, there, something ain't right with that. But it, it's problematic to me when black men brag about it as if it's a badge of honor. Honor to me, and maybe I'm the one. I don't. I don't know what to do with that information. You know, what, you know what I'm saying. I don't know what the question is, but it's problematic yeah. on so many levels because I know so many black men who say they've had sexual experiences as a young person with grown women, and they brag about it. <laughs> I, I get to that in this. Um, that's the first thing that we're trained to do. Uh, it makes you look like the person who won, um, the person who conquered. And I think that um, it, it's a conversation that, that we just, that we never, ever, ever have. Um, you know, I don't know how my father would have responded to that story at that particular time because I just, I just don't know. Um, he may have been angry or it, it could have been a high five. Like, I don't, I don't know, but I know I was terrified and I know there's nothing wrong with me being terrified. You don't really even realize that until, you know, and just being in these spaces. And I'm sure like this other people in the room who've been, in, who've been in spaces similar to mine, you have these feelings inside of you and then you just, you look at some of the things your friends do and you do things that they would never dream of doing things that they're terrified of. And then it starts to feel like, wait, 
so we're all liars. <laughs> like we're all sitting here lying because, you know, we we were supposed to go fight such and such, and you was talking about it the whole way up there. You was going through this, you was going through that, and you was going through this and that, and then you didn't even come into the venue. So, like, I think um, I wanted to try to to ta not tackle the issue as a whole because I'm just one person, but I, I feel like, um, you know, I, I have a platform and I, I have people that, 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 that read my work or subscribe to, like, some of my essays and stuff like that. And I just, I've never seen anyone have that conversation before, so I wanted to have the conversation. I think the badge of honor is, it's, it's, it's not true, but we're not going to get there until we actually start pulling each other cards and having real conversations about it. Um, I told this story to my friends, some of my friends I'm writing about in this book, and it was like a joke. It was like a joke. I'm talking about I waited until I was like 20, and I told the story, and it was like, yo, you fucking sucker. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, and, um, and that just gave me the power to hold it for like another 20 years. You know what I mean? So... I think that we start having honest conversations, we can kind of try to erase that energy in our culture in general. That's that follow up? Or not yet? Have did you tell any women in Athens that you can just tell them? Or? No, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't say anything. I never told any. Even the guy who brought you there, you didn't know that they had to. No, oh no, we, we, we celebrated it. That's what I get to in the next couple of pages. It was kind of like a win for them. Like it was like a like a thing for them. It was like a like a, of like a rite of pa it was so the whole camp I don't know, it's it's not a lot it's not um a lot of people in here from Baltimore. It's like but people for but so I don't know if you remember this, but it was something called it was a program called Camp Furthest Out. And it was for mainly for kids who from Murphy Homes housing projects. I'm not from Murphy Homes. I'm not even from West Baltimore. At the time, I never even heard of Murphy Homes. So when I went over there and they like, where you from? And I'm telling them where I'm from. And it was like, yo, what the fuck are you? Like everybody looks, it, was, it would be like um, David Duke pulling up at, you know, to like the hear Fred Hampton speak. The people was looking at you like, yo, what are you doing here? And it was kind of like a hellish experience from, um, until until I fought back, right? So that's another lesson that's in the first section. Until I fought back, um, and fighting back is not fighting back is not tussling and punching and slinging each other to the ground. Fighting back is blood sport. Like you beat until you on that person until they stop until they make you stop, and then they might let you go or they will beat you anyway to prove their point. But you know, so you know, I I I, I took a couple whippings there too, but it was. Just to put in context, this camp was, um, you stay away for two weeks and it costs like $10. <laughs> so I don't know if they had like grant money or like funding or something like that. But um, it's, it's funny because um, I was giving a talk like not too long ago and um, or maybe it wasn't long ago, this is the pandemic stuff, I don't have a good hold of time. But I was giving a talk and I was like wondering, somebody was like asking me a question about me not liking the outdoors. And I just kind of thought about that moment and like, yo, this is probably why I don't fuck with nature. Like, <laughs> this is probably like, I don't get excited to go hiking or like, oh my God, did you see the trail? Like, like nah, I ain't fucking with no trail. <laughs> but maybe not, I mean, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm just lazy. <laughs> and I'm hoping that, you know, we start having that conversation because what you're talking about, it feels like toxic masculinity that, that bleeds over into us, women. So I just hope that this, Something causes us to start having these. The name of the book was supposed to be called Smile, right? Because mm -hmm. the publishing industry is the way the publishing industry is. They wanted to call the book Black Boy Smile. But the purpose of the book was to talk about not just toxic masculinity inside of us, but how it affects other people, but then also how other people feed it. Um, there's instances where people were honored and like amazed if I maybe fought somebody or they were honored and amazed if I spent money on a gift, right? Like, or like, like all of these different things that fuel ego are just like, um, 
they just all add to it, and we don't we don't we don't process our feelings. Yeah, I love. <clears throat> I just wanted to follow up to what you said. Um, so, it's a lot of misguidance in the black community, and it's specifically with black males. So, I was in a similar situation in the D. It wasn't with an older woman, but I was pressured at a young age to have sex, mm -hmm. and you are expected to do that because that's a rite of passage to become a man. And at that time, growing up in the 90s, early 2000s, if you don't do it, you get all kinds of names thrown at you or implications that about your sexuality that most young boys can't really handle. So you're just gonna conform to whatever is most comfortable. And like D said, the word is, uh, when he said fight, he talking about physically, but it's a bigger fight. It's a mental fight, it's an emotional fight. It's a lot of young men that cannot handle that fight, let alone handle it on their own. And growing up in Baltimore, you have a lot of toxic masculinity, whatever that word is, um, but it's just misguidance. You got a lot of young men growing up without their fathers. Um, mothers probably at work all the time. So you're looking for love. You're looking for acceptance. And in that situation that he's talking about, acceptance from your homeboys, and you look in, not necessarily, it's inappropriate love. If that woman or that girl is telling you you're cute, nobody else told you that before, they showing some interest, quite naturally you're gonna be attracted to that. So that's why I love this brother so much because I feel like for him to go from where he was to where he is, he's breaking that cycle yeah. of just misguidance. And um, yeah, like we need the support of black women just as well as y'all need the support from us. Um, it's a lot of that that still goes on. I come from Baltimore and it's a tough city. It's a tough city to live in. Um, it's a tough city to grow up in. If you're watching We Own The City, it's just like that. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> you just gotta like give some grace to these young men and um, you know, just understand like everybody comes from different environments and everybody doesn't have the tools to handle it like a lot of us can handle it or can see it at the age that we are. Thank you, thank, thank you for that, thank you for that. I, I think, I also think that um, me being an older person is, is, is my responsibility to say it. Like, I think, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of dudes my age in their 30s and 40s and all that, that um, it's crazy, like, when I, I was with my uncle briefly the other day and I haven't talked to him maybe like three years and I saw him for about 15 minutes everything that he was saying was the same stuff he told me when I was like five six or seven years old no nah, because this building this project such and such know this such and such know that such and such know that and this and that and this and that and it's like do you ever will you ever get the opportunity to take the mask off will you ever be able to take the mask off stuff you talking about you talking about you holding on to these stories and you know i love them to death it's family but you holding on to these stories this the resiliency of the stories of a property that's not even there no more the building is gone there's no lafayette housing projects there's no 125 building there's no there's no there's nothing left but the stories and all of the stories are about dominance but it's also over a lot of people who are also gone they're also gone. So like the scariest thing, one of the scariest things for me, and you know, is when I when I when I have conversations with my daughter, um, when I have conversations with um with young men um from the city, from other cities or whatever, is for me to lean on them stories about the nineties and the eighties and what we was doing, like what we was doing in ninety seven. What like how our era was this and that, because it don't it doesn't it doesn't help. It doesn't help, like, you know what I mean? Like, and, and then it also never really comes out like how it happened. Like, I remember this dude named Keon. I remember this dude named Keon had, um, um, I came home with all this steam because he got locked up in a house raid. There was a gun in there, there was a gun in there, right? Like, yo, he got locked up with a gun, he, locked, he was, we was young. But the, part, the real part of the story that they don't tell is, well, he got locked up, he was trying to flush the gun down the toilet. <laughs> like, that's the part that don't come out. You know what I mean? That's the part that don't come out. So it's like, you know, we, we're lost. And 
you know, we, we, we you know, and, and those of us who have learned from some of the things we, we've been through, I feel like, you know, I like when we try to shed, spread that love and have that conversation. Nobody's super tough. Nobody wins every fight. Nobody drives on the beltway and never misses an exit. <laughs> I just want to follow up on her question, but also I have two questions. So you spoke about we got to unlearn that because this is uh, I work with young people, and I just had a I had a young person tell me that tell me this story, and it was just like to see the enthusiasm in them. And I'm just like I'm just sitting there listening, trying to hold back my expression about it, and then trying to have that real conversation with him about like what really took place like and how what happened is kind of a reason why you in the situation you in you into the things you into because of this experience that happened to you that wasn't supposed to happen to you so you talked about unlearning that. how i guess like you said someone speaking to young folks being a little older how do you unlearn that that enthusiasm in that in that behavior, in that experience? So I think the best thing to do is to be honest. And maybe, they, maybe they're maybe they in a the place to receive it, and maybe they're not, but we gotta, we, we gotta be honest. Um, I know my wife gotta check me for certain things that still is out of me from when I was a kid. You know what I mean? And at 40, you don't wanna hear that. You know what I mean? But you have to, you, you have to hear it. You have you have to respond, and, and I think I think that honesty is difficult, but but it's necessary because guess what? You working with them. Nobody else is probably telling them. Right. People didn't tell me these things. Like people didn't tell me these things, and as a result, um, if I had information that was good or bad, I would just go off of it because I was never checked. <laughs> Nobody said, "Shorty, this is works like this," or these things go like this, or this is how this should be, or that this is how that should be, for the most part. Now, I had some positive people in my life, and, you know, for sure, like, I'm not, like, gonna, you know, I wasn't raised by, like, wolves or anything like that, but I'm saying, you know, my grandmother loved me dearly, my mother loved me dearly, my father loved me, and, you know, always tried to do the best he could. I, I still had to go outside, you know what I mean? And that's that's just what it is. So. If you're in a position where you big homie, big brother, and you the person that's connecting on a level where they're not going to listen to their parents or they're not going to listen to their uncles or whoever might have some sense, that sometimes you might be the only person they get it from. And it's just the truth. And maybe they, they might agree with it. They might, they might, what's your name? Josh. They might be like, something, and this happens, this happens to me. Like, this happens to me. Um, a kid I mentored or knew from like seven years ago would be like, yo, I, I, you was right. You know what I mean? And they're still young. They may be like 22 years old, 23 years old. They're still kids. But I told them something when they was 14 that just stuck. And they didn't feel it at the time, but it eventually paid dividends. So even if it's not like an instant response to what um, the way you tried to show love is, it, it, so, you know, it, it, it sticks with them and it, and, 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 and it might just come out in a different way. Or they might share it with another person, which is even more beautiful. My second question is more the light in the mood, because you talk about the book goes dark and gets lighter. I guess on the light side of things, you know, per personally, like being a young black man, why did you decide to marry your, who's your current wife now? You know what I'm saying? Because I'm sure you, throughout your life, you've dealt with many different women. What, what's, what's <laughs> not like that. <laughs> 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 I hope she's not in here, but she, uh, yeah. she in the back, uh, she in the back, back row, yeah. <laughs> she in the back row. But just, she but just as a, just as a, a older black man than myself, yeah. like, like, like in that move of like, to make that decision, because you also don't see that. You talk about statistics and numbers, you don't see a lot of black men getting married. So just being where you from, like, what made you make take that next step and be a married man and you know fatherhood and all that just. The simple, the simple answer, the simple answer is, so I was in love with her since the first time I saw her, right? And I didn't really understand, I didn't understand that. I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what that meant. Um, when I got a little older, I understood that I did not want to live my life without her. <laughs> so, you know, marriage is the obvious. Um, 
it's the obvious, but I mean, I would cut off my arm if she asked me to. You know what I mean? Like, I might not go downstairs in the middle of the night to get her some juice. No, I'm gonna do that too. But, <laughs> but, but you realize, like, you, in life, you're gonna meet people and you're gonna have connections with people. You're gonna date some people. Sometimes it's gonna be cool. Sometimes it's gonna be a little shaky. But there's gonna come a time where you're gonna meet a person that you don't want to see your future. You don't want to. You don't want to imagine your future without them. And when you meet that person, hold on to them. Cause you'll never, ever, ever, you'll never, ever, 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 ever meet anybody like that person ever again. Um, I'm not, you know, not bragging on my wife cause she's here, but people who know her know she fits into, she can, she can do corporate, she can do network, she can do game night, she can go to the hood bar, she can do what, like, she checked every box, you know what I'm saying? And most importantly she cares about me but even more importantly she loves our child more than anything in the world and i already knew she would be like that before we even talked about having a kid i was like damn she would be a great mom you know because she would do shit like nurse a squirrel back to health like shit you know what i'm saying like something i would walk past but um but no all, jo all jokes aside like you you meet people in your life and out of everyone I ever met in my life, this is the only person I ever met that I can like honestly say like, damn, I would never, ever, ever even want to think about a future without her being right there. It's like, I gotta die first. Sorry, sorry, baby. <laughs> sorry to go dock again. <laughs> I'm curious to know, um, as you climb the ladder, um, when you go into these different rooms and meetings, what's the reception of these corporate folks when they know that you're from Baltimore? You tell them that you're from Baltimore. It's, it's crazy. I hit a wall for a lot of years, and now I'm finally at a space where people are starting to want to do business with me because I'm me. Like, a lot, like, like my first my first book deal. Um, someone told my agent um, it was even at an email chain or in a cocktail conversation. Somebody who's from East Baltimore, who lives in East Baltimore, who is writing a book about East Baltimore and wants a deal, he'll die before his pub date. These, this is how the white people used to talk <laughs> amongst themselves in happy times. This was, this was the conversation in like 2013. This was the, con not even a long time ago, this was the conversation in 2013, 2014. Like my first book didn't come out to 2015, but um, it was a time where, um, you know, if you didn't, um, check those um, Twitter woke boxes, then you wasn't getting no, you wasn't getting, you wasn't going to get to it. You wasn't getting no show opportunities. You were, I mean, it's some people that figured out their way through the cracks, but it wasn't, it was like a strange thing. So it's like now, um, I finally, and it's probably started happening for me around 2019, 2018, 2019, as people people started to open up and be like, oh, okay, well, we see whatever whatever he has, we know he can sell books, so he can get a book deal for the rest of his life. But they weren't like that at first. Like it was like it was. Let me. I'm gonna tell you the story real quick. It's a quick story. It's a quick story. It's a quick story, and it's a guessing game. Can we play a guessing game? Yeah. It's a guessing game. All right, boom. So my first time I got a chance to sit down with a publisher, it wasn't gonna be hardback. It was trade paperback. And she told me I can uh, meet with her, and I think it was like maybe around like four or five o'clock on like a Friday um, in New York at, at the publishing house, right? So I get there early, like three something. Four comes, I'm early. Meeting time comes. Oh, she'll be 15 minutes. Oh, she'll be 15 minutes. Oh, sorry, Mr. Watkins, would you like some water or juice? She'll be 15 minutes. That turned into like three and a half hours. I mean, sitting in the lobby, right? I come in the back. And she's like, oh, yeah, you're that guy. I read your proposal. You're good at proposals. Yeah, so look, check this out. Uh, you're like Snoop from The Wire. We'll give you a ghostwriter, and you can put together a book, and you'll do something nice. And I used that conversation to kind of talk her into, like, promising me a deal, right? Because she, she wasn't as sharp as – anyway, anyway, this is a guessing game, right? So I go out in New York, celebrate, whatever, come back home. Monday morning come. Um, <laughs> Monday morning come. It's funny because I'm, um, shout out to my man Noah. I'm a substitute teacher, right? At the time, I'm a substitute teaching, right? It's like, you know, I was a good substitute. I was 
Jay-Z is substitute teachers. But um, but I'm substitute teacher, and I'm sitting, I'm sitting in the classroom, all of the bad kids who can't go into the cafeteria, they hanging out in my classroom, so we in there, we kicking it and chill, I get the phone call. And um, the agent, the agent um, basically said that, well, the editor called me first, and the editor's like, yo, we about to send this deal over. We about to send this deal over to, um, to your agent. If you work with this ghostwriter, um, a white man named like um no his name was something else something like real like uh, traditional like um like thomason or something like that thomas thompson or something, whatever whatever his name was he ghost writes books but it would be like d watkins with him like i did the carmelo book like carmelo with d it would be d watkins with um the white guy who ghost writes books your deal would be four hundred and fifty thousand dollars mind you i'm a substitute teacher and i'm i'm broke right i'm broke like not like uh, um, I can't eat broke, but like kind of like you know, <laughs> I I'll turn up next week broke. <laughs> Y'all want to do game night like that broke? So uh, <laughs> so four hundred fifty thousand dollars, right? Four hundred four hundred four hundred and fifty thousand dollars on the table, right? White boy gets thirty percent. Boom. I'm not just a story. I'm a storyteller. I don't need him to write my book. No, run the numbers off me. I wanna, I wanna do this myself, right? I'm almost done. Like, you don't know me from uh, having a story. You know me from what I wrote. You know me from the essays I published. I got some shit in the New York Times. Like, come on, like, what's, like come on, right? She come back. How much money do you think they offered me? 400. You said 400? Can I get another guess? Hundred thousand? Can I get one more? Twenty? Fifteen thousand dollars. From four hundred and fifty thousand dollars to fifteen thousand dollars. And because I'm stubborn and because I'm not letting nobody do nothing like that for me, I took I tightened my belt. I, maybe I lost like maybe I needed to lose the extra fifteen pounds, but <laughs> but fifteen thousand dollars and that that so that's the industry that I came into. Um and I had to work a lot and write a lot and come to a lot of bullshit, and a lot of meetings and functions and fucking galas. Of, <laughs> I'm tripping because I see Tony right here. And the first time my wife was my, who was, I don't know what we were at the time. I guess she was my, I guess she was like my homegirl. I guess she was like my mentor. I don't know what she was <laughs> at the time. But um, the first time we actually hung out and like maybe like the first time I wore dress shoes in like 10 years. <laughs> was at an event that uh, me, her, and Tony was at. But, um, but yeah, that's the industry that I came into, and it took a whole lot of work to, to get there. And then the only flip side of it is that a lot of other writers um, that, that I know, I, I got a, a chance, I had a chance to try my best to try to fast track them in different ways, introducing them to like editors and, and like, or like foundations, like hooks, books, and pen fuckness and all them different stuff, and just trying to like figure out ways to try to help fast track them, you know, through some of the BS that I had to go through, but I still had to go through it. And like, you know, it, it, it finally started clicking as far as like, um, People not trying to make me sound a certain way or, or talk a certain way or be a certain way within like like around like 2019. Dude asked me, I went on fresh air, dude asked me the cold switch, but he didn't know how to say it without sounding, you know what I mean, racist. And the fucked up that I didn't know how to cold switch. Like I didn't know I had to Google that shit. Like I didn't know what he was talking about. And then I tried, <laughs> like I tried and it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work. All places, I'm walking down the street in Boston, and a dude was like, nigga, I looked you up. I looked you up and shit. I was like, what? Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> he was like, he was like, no, I heard you on NPR. And I'm like, yo, why the fuck you listen to NPR? But then, I, then, we, but then we like laughed and joked for a little bit. But he was like, no, nah, normally, you know, something, something. But man, you went on there, you kept it real, man. In my mind, I'm like, damn, I cold switch. It didn't work. So <laughs> I thought I was cold switching, you know what I mean? Like, you know, so that's. That's the industry, and I, and I think, I, I will hope that it gets better. I just think we need more, like, I, I, I love, like, I, I'm creating a television show. I already sold it to, I already sold it. Um, I already sold it to a production company that has a deal with 20th Century, but I'm trying my best to, to I'm executive producer on it, and I'm trying to create a world so that I can put the people who need to be in that world in that world, and I can't do that 
from just being a writer. I got to be a person who pushes buttons, not somebody who's waiting for a button to be pushed. That's, that's the game. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question. So. They had called me. Um, they, they, so David Simon, I wrote this essay called Two Four for Pop Culture way back in 2014, which is like maybe the first real essay I ever published. And I got emails from all these people, and one of them was David. And he was like, um, and he said, um, <laughs> but we just, ha we just happy to see you. We just, ha we, we just happy to see you. But, <laughs> okay. Politics and pros, my friend. It's all good. How you feel? Fine. You good? So it's one of the uh, worst days ever, but oh no, it's it's fine. It's fine. No, we, no, you you know what's going on in the world. Oh right? yeah, yeah. Oh my God, yeah. It's now up to eighteen children. Oh my God. Oh my God. Up to eighteen children. So it was a mass shooting at an elementary school. And you're going to Texas. Shh. It could surpass Sandy Hook. So as I was trying to get to you, oh, no. I was listening. But I'm proud of you. <laughs> Thank we we gonna keep we gonna keep we gonna keep them young people, them families, yeah. and I could I couldn't imagine I couldn't imagine. It's horrific, um, and you know, you and I both grew up in a place where failure is in our very existence. Guns are the conversation. Baltimore City is having a hard time with guns right now. Yeah. People don't want to have that conversation, but I think we, I think this country has proved that it's not responsible enough to have firearms. They need to ban them. First, the numbers were two, or when I was in the office at five o'clock, two mm. children and one teacher. The suspect is gone. It rose before I left. I left in time to get to politics and pros on Connecticut Avenue by seven. <laughs> But by that time, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm not alone. In my defense, I put the I put the uh, address on the flyer. The address on the is on. The <laughs> I just did, how many of us retweet without thank you? But that's my bad. That's my bad. But I, but you know what? But let me tell you something. As high as gas was, I said I'm not gonna let D Watkins down. I was in Southwest. I, my car was taken. I said I'm gonna get here. I said, Look at your phone. I got a, a picture of where I was. But let me say this real quick. When mm. I left, it wound up going to mm. 17. Jesus Christ. I drove, as I was driving on Connecticut Avenue, matter of fact, I want to show you my video. Mm. I, Kamala Harris's motorcade whizzed by me because she was on her way to speak about it. Go to thegrio.com. We're writing about it. And then coming in here, the numbers are now 18. Jesus Christ. And there are more kids in the hospital fighting for their lives. And the gunman is dead and he killed his grandmother as well. <sighs> Senseless. And, and we have to wait for this, but for any, and then, and then this, will, this will go down, and it'll it, 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 it subside, and the conversation will change, as you know, with the news cycle, and then, and then. It's gonna, and that's what they're saying. But think of this. Because it just happened last week. Yes, yeah, <laughs> that's what I was gonna say, copycat. This is, even though Buffalo was hate, this is still another mass shooting. And guess what? Just find out, um, it's like Gutenberg, the father of one of the kids was killed in that shooting um, the, four years ago. I forgot the name of the school. Parkland. It was a major shooting. Parkland. Parkland. Parkland, yes. He said the NRA is having a convention in Texas this weekend. And I bet they won't cancel it. Nope. But they pro life. They gave a, they gave a, so the NRA, made, they made a statement about the shooting in Buffalo last week, and they, they sent out a tweet um, still talking about this is, you know, we don't need gun control. We need, you know, people have guns, ignoring the fact that the security guard had a gun, and he sh hit him twice, but the kid had on body armor, so it didn't matter, and then he killed the security guard. So there's, there's that. There's your argument for, for that. But I, I wrote an essay some years ago about, um, our problems with guns and mm -hmm. like banning guns and 
I, I've never got more death threats in my life. Like I've never read, n wrote nothing that went viral on like the Republican side. Like, <laughs> like I, I can't. It was like a picture of my grandmother on my Instagram. Cause this was years ago. And then in the comments like, "Fuck your grandmother." Hashtag pew pew life. Cause that's what they do. Hashtag no, pew pew. Like I'm like, this is these people are crazy. Like, <laughs> like they crazy. When a black man or a black woman stands up to speak truth against their institutional bedrock, you are a threat. You are a threat. But I want to say this, and I, and I hate, I'm sorry that I'm late. But again, I had to get here from my Baltimore <laughs> home. And let me say this to you. We talked about this book, and I know, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. But we talked about this book. I'm going to get real personal about this. We talked about this book a couple of years ago. We're both from Baltimore. And again, not many cities in this nation have the word failure built into the existence of its resident. Baltimore does. And that word came from Bishop Walter Scott Thomas, the pastor of the late Elijah Cummings. And he's right. For this brother to make it out, to be prolific, to write about what he writes about, and to be honest in this book. And we talked about this book before, I think he was, we were, he was birthing it at that time that we were talking about it. Because I was saying I was dating a guy from Baltimore. Again, if you know Baltimore, you understand Baltimore. The streets are cruel, the communities are cruel. Even Elijah Cummings, when he was alive in one of my books said, it's hard being in those high lofty perches sometimes because the old haunts come back and hurt you. You wonder if you're good enough, if you're strong enough, if you're supposed to be. And a lot of brothers in the city have a hard time with that and, and then relationships and beings. And that's, you know, I think we, I think we were talking about it. He was trying to help me along with that relationship. That relationship is now dead. But, <laughs> but we talked about that. Yep. Being a man who can emote, being a man who can walk proudly and still be have swag, but also have emotion and be in touch with himself. One of the things I, I, I tried to write about in this book was how hard it was for me, is how, it, how hard it has been for me to do simple things like say I'm sorry or to say you hurt my feelings. It's like moving a mountain and that, that's the difficult part. That's the difficult part, and that's what we actively try to work, try to work past. That's what our conversation was about. It's it's very it's very very difficult. Um, you know, I'm I'm not gonna go on camera and say uh, Baltimore doesn't have a great dating pool. <laughs> You're like, where's the camera? <laughs> Look at the my camera number three. <laughs> my fiance happens to be from another state, so that's a whole other thing. But but he lives he lives in Baltimore now. Welcome, so. welcome, brother. <laughs> But no, I, I think um, it, it, it took me some time, and it, it took me it took me some some years to to, to look at to look at myself, um, and that's the main thing. I, I can talk about the the culture I grew up in. I can talk about the lessons that was left for me, but I'm not really having a conversation until I, I look at I look at myself. I look at myself, and I tell myself that you know. You are wrong a lot. You don't get it a lot, and it's not all about you. And when you don't get your way, um, you don't get to be childish. <laughs> and if everybody said that, you know, then we will all, you know, we will, we will go a little further. But um, hopefully this book encourages people to, to do that because that's, that's brave too. But, you know, you, by acknowledging it and writing about it, you are embracing it and you're beating the curse that has plagued so many in Baltimore and so many men in so many others. Detroit, Chicago. DC. How about Washington that, brother? DC. How about that, yes. <laughs> and this kind of conversation helps men as well as women understand that that gruff, hard ex exterior is not necessarily just about them it's about what you've experienced throughout your life how you've become hard that hard shell that a lot of times we try to crack because it's you know we we oh i can help him sisters they got to help themselves before we can go help them uh oh <laughs> oh we're talking about my daughter uh -huh. i mean yeah.
You from Alabama? Say it loud and proud. Damon Young. Damon Young. So when I read his book, I'm like, wait a minute. So these dudes ain't, ain't tough as I thought? Because he talked about fear and... Men uh, cry. The hardest I men actually, cry. Actually, I want to go on record and say that I never, I never thought Damon Young was tough. He's my great friend, though. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> He's my great friend. <laughs> right. Right. Well, can and I you tell know, you? City oh. girls, city girls, city, city girls, city girl grandmothers and mothers say, "Oh no, go get a Lee boy, get a boy down south." And you guys, the southern women are looking right. The southern, the southern women are looking for that tough exterior. Well, we're scared of it because we don't know what to do with it. Like you said, we're trying to track it. It can't be tracked. We're trying to whatever. For me, it was fear. Like some dudes, they way above my head. I felt like I'm a little kid compared to them. You know what I mean? Because they they appear to be. And you get hurt along the way. I, yeah. I, I think the, one of the main things, you know, if, if I can just try to get to the bottom of it, one of the main things is we don't have anything. And our only currency is resiliency. So we're going to hold on to that. We don't have stocks and buildings and resources and limitless opportunities. We just got the fact that we tougher than the next person. And sure. if I say I'm going to punch you in your mouth, I'm going to do it. That's all we, we have. We're rich in that. <laughs> We're rich in that. And the that's tennis shoe, rich in that, <laughs> the tennis shoe. But now brothers are getting into Bitcoin now. Some of the, some of the street uh, brothers One more person tell me about some Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, Bitcoin is... Saying, no, but I'm hearing... Yeah. But a lot of our street brothers are trying to educate themselves in different ways. It's, it's a whole different subset, I guess you would say. Culture, you know, when you are living that hard life, trying to put a barrier, put this invisible barrier, don't touch me, I'm untouchable. You know, I, I live above with all this stuff. I'm... I'm but that's that's what it is though is we don't have anything except for that so we lean on that and i, I mean not that you know i guess it's not a shameless plug because we're here but that's what a, that's book. that's what a lot of it is we're leaning on that because that's all we have and we go out into this world and is you know as black man's expectations white man's expectations they're kind of the same thing except for we got the racism. We got <laughs> we got the we got the the, the limited opportunity. We got whatever kind of neighborhood we live in. And we got all of these different hurdles. We got to jump just to kind of compete on the same level, even though you're supposed to be this provider, this conqueror, this person who gets things done. You got to get it done with all of that other stuff, and you have nothing left over at the end of that. But these, and until we have that conversation, we'll never get to the bottom of where that comes from. Go ahead. Oh, that's Dee's wife. Hey, Dee's wife. So I'm Karan, but I just wanted to say this. Dee writes this book from his perspective, but I'm sure if you read it, we can all identify with something yes. in this yeah. book. I know when we talked about different moments as he was, you know, you know, putting this book out and we're looking through it and reading it, there were things I went through that mm. we were able to talk about. But yes, it's from a female perspective. And he went through it from a male perspective, but we both went through it. And so I encourage you all to like when you read it, it's not just, yes, he's looking at the toxic masculinity, but it's toxicity in all. And what we all have experienced yes. it and gone through something. So I just, you know, it, I know people are here because you support him and you're going to read the book, but share it with other people. It's not just for black boys, it's for all of us. So let me, and, I, and I'm glad she stood up because. Um, Lisa thank, Respers thank you, talked about you quite a bit. <laughs> Lisa Respers, you know who I'm talking about. She loves you. And we talked about you because we were like talking about you guys a couple, maybe a year or so ago. And for all of Dee's experiences, he melts with his wife. He melts with the baby. And for all of this toughness that is now breaking, because I'm sure you're still working. You know, we all are a work in progress. Look at this cover. This cover is like, I'm a marshmallow. I'm melting. You know, it's like, for all, no, and I, I'm not, I'm not trying, no, but, no, but I'm serious. But 
No, th this brother ain't no joke. But you know, <laughs> but what I'm saying is this cover to me reflects the evolution. Being able to because a lot of brothers, a lot of brothers in the hood still won't wear pink. Am I am I lying? No, you're not lying. Right. And this to me is that evolution of I'm embracing it all. You know, if you go on his Instagram page, he gushes about that baby and his wife. And it's wonderful to see when men can do that. It's wonderful to see that. I don't, it's, it's not weak. No. You know, it's not weak. It's embracing what you have. And he's got a, they're a dynamic couple together. So you're welcome. And that, somewhat, yes. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, my name's Tony. Um, first of all, I just want to say to bro, he had treasure um, in more ways than one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had the opportunity uh, he shared this book with me a few months ago. Um, and during that time, um, I do a lot of work in um, violence interruption and reentry and things of that nature here in DC. Um, and I was reading two books about trauma. Uh, mm -hmm. One was um, uh, The Body Keeps Score, and the other one was My Grandmother's Hands, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 you know, both of those books talking about um, sort of the impacts of trauma uh, on people. And then I read, I cracked open D's book. And those books fail in comparison to, to his book as it relates to trauma um, and, and its impacts. And D is speaking, yeah, from, um, you know, I think for me, we come from, we, I'm from DC, even Baltimore, we come from the same culture though, or the same subculture. And it's things in the book that some people hear in, in the world, right? Um, and I agree with Karan totally, it's for everybody. But there's some shit in there that, like spoke directly to me, right, or into us, people that come from a world, we, the world we come from, that I don't think anybody has ever really covered that base from, mm. as, particularly as it relates to trauma. And, and, and really, from a gener generational perspective as well, right? His, his, his tales about his interaction with his mom, with his dad, with his peers, and, and, and so some of that exterior thing that people see from us when we come, it's not like always a facade though, right? It, part of it is like this book is saying, look who I am now, right? And I've always been this guy, but where I come from, I couldn't always show that. Or I had to have, I had to show other parts of myself in order to survive to the point where I could become who I am. A defense also, mechanism. Right, but now that I'm here, but now that I'm here, right, I get to this point, right? And I'm married and I got, I got two daughters, he got one, right? We in these spaces and we're considered to be leaders and people look to us, but now I still got a whole other thing to figure out. Because now everything that I thought was true, everything I thought how I was supposed to act and what I'm supposed to do, and now I got this woman beside me saying, no, baby, you ain't gotta do that. Or you don't have to, we get into an argument, you don't have to like act like you never wanna see me again, right? We can talk this through. These are some of the things that I've had to go through my wife, but in my past experiences, So you go back to your happened. old brain, you Absolutely. go back to fight or flight. Absolutely, and so yeah. now, that, I think that is the struggle of being um, a black man coming from with the culture that we come from. When you don't die, when you early, you don't go to prison, when you become something, but you don't have models to show you how and what you're supposed to be. You don't game plan for it. It's none. And I hope people really got to, and he's tapping into that um, in this book in a way again. So I want to just everybody, when you reading it, just you know, um, have a, a completely open mind. Don't think you know, because a lot of times I think when we tell our stories, right, because of media and movies and music and shit, people think they already know what's in there. You don't know what's in there. Like you don't know what's in there read it and think, and so, so any of those other books from these doctors or from these other, they can never tell um, what he's telling in his books. I, I, I appreciate you, bro. Um, you know, it's, it's always love, man. Keep doing what you're doing, don't ever stop. We gonna, you know what I mean? You, you, you a voice um, that we, that's much needed, man. More than I think people truly understand. Thank you for what you did in this book, bro. The first-hand uh, experience you. is everything. Thank you. So D, what, and I'm, I'm, I'm all late and coming all taking over, but <laughs> Lee, uh, well not Lee, D, what would you tell some of these women, other women, and your daughter, when she becomes of age and she sees someone, because you know we mirror when we date our daddy. <laughs> oh, y'all like who, that? Who, mm. who, me? 
Who me? Yeah, what would you oh, tell, gonna tell your daughter? Her, what would you tell her? Run kids? fast. No, <laughs> no. I'm, you know, so one thing, one thing I, I want to do, and I, you know, I, I hope and pray Karan hold me to this. Um, I, I, I really, 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 really want to just be there for her, regardless of whatever decision she makes. If I want to give her some game, but at the same time, I, I want to trust her. To, to be able to move how she want to move. And when she gets it right, I want to celebrate her. When she gets it wrong, I want to be there to, like, give her a hug and be like, yo, it's, it's going to be cool, you know. And if somebody, you know, disrespect her, I want her to push the button. I don't want to just go all crazy. I want her to say, all right, daddy, crack his head. Or I want her to say, daddy, pray for him. It's going to be her decision. <laughs> it's going to be her decision. I don't want to I don't want to jump I don't want I don't want to be that person because I, I remember like even when I was when I was growing up, I I have an older sister and um you know, I, I remember how some people in my family would act when my sister would go through something with a guy and they and for a while they made me act like that because I you know, again, you think this is what the way What was that, like that? So, okay, so my sister was dating a guy, and they broke up, and she cried. And my cousin, Kevin, who is like a real close, like a real, like, like more like a brother, you know, he wanted to beat the dude up. And we were, I was in middle school, they was in high school, but we, you know, we went and we beat the dude up. And like, um, then, you know, eventually at some point, the, uh, the guy who my sister broke up with, they realigned again, and then they broke up again. So it's just kind of like, you know, and I don't, but at the time, I was young, but at the same time, I was the kind of young person who, when I did bad stuff as a kid, like, I knew I did bad stuff. So I don't, like, I don't try to, you know, I never try to sit here and say I was a kid. Like, I, every good thing I did as a child and every bad thing I did as a child, I knew exactly what I was doing. When I set them trash cans on fire, when I, you know, like, I know, ex like, I know, ex I always knew exactly what I was doing. I, was like, I don't get no grace. <laughs> don't give me no grace. But, um... I thought that was the way to act because that's how a person who I looked up to was acting and it wasn't it wasn't the way to act. So I, I never want to be a person to act like I know. I don't want to try to prescribe um, hand out prescriptions and I'm not a doctor and I didn't do the research and I don't really understand what the problem is. I just want to listen. I want to love. I want to pull up the best way for me to pull up. That's what I want to do. So D, um, I want to ask you one last question and then you can take the floor. What would you say to your younger self, looking back? Don't quit. Always, 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 always show love. Show love first, even if you're confronted by hate, just show love. Like, matching hate with hate is never gonna get the desired result. I've never, ever, ever ever responded with hate and felt good afterwards. So I would tell myself to try to avoid that. Would you believe in yourself more? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like, <laughs> if I look at, like, look, looking at what I do for a living now, like, you know, like I'm, like we was talking about this a little bit earlier, but I finally got to the position where I just say no to stuff. Like, and I've never, ever, ever, even just being a writer starting out, I never thought I would be able to just tell people no, like for stuff that's cool and like interesting and like amazing. And I'm like, oh my God, that sounds amazing. Nah, like I've never thought I would ever be able to do that. Like you, you don't think that. So now it's like, yo, I actually really like, you know, and not intentionally ruining somebody's day, but it's ruining like, you know, it was a time where like starting out, I have a book event like this and I'd be like, damn, I'll never sell a book again. You know, but like it's, it's not the case, so I'm, I would definitely believe in myself. Um, oh, I want to ask you a question too. So, um, what you asked me about the show? Oh, yeah. yeah. So it's a very interesting experience. Um, um, we we talk about this on the podcast, and it's crazy because another person outside outside of um, the project actually brought this to my attention, but I actually kind of broke the story <laughs> of the Gun Trace Task Force before it was the Gun Trace Task Force. Um, there was a cop named Daniel Herschel that had harassed me when I was younger, and then when I got older, he harassed a young rapper. So I'm making a transition from like streets to like little BS jobs to journalists, and now that I'm a journalist, I'm actually covering a guy who harassed me, who's giving that pain to the next generation. So there was a story in the Baltimore Sun about the settlements paid out 
to um, victims of, of, of his brutality, right? But I was the first person to actually get stories from victims and compile them and then inspire other writers to start getting stories from other victims. And it created this big file that when it was actually time for him to get indicted, they had all of these public um, published articles to draw from. So when they were putting together the writer's room, that was that came up in a conversation. And um, David Simon had called me and said, um, and I have met him a long time ago. He, he liked the essay I wrote, and he asked me if I ever wanted to work on television to hit him up. And I hit him up like two minutes later, like, all right, how about now? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Like, you just skip right past this book stuff. But, uh, but no. But he sent me, he, has, he, he, link, he linked me with some people from Ferguson, and he sent mm. me, and I went to Ferguson for probably like, probably like three weeks or something like that. And I was supposed to be doing a story. There's a guy named Chad Coleman, and I, I was supposed to, he was, he was going to play Mike Brown's father, and I was supposed to shadow Mike, I, was, I shadowed Mike Brown's father, and I hung out with Chad the whole time, and I wrote the treatment and all of that stuff, and then I found out that um, something was like a problem with the life rights. So I went home and it was it was no deal. And then David sent me out with another guy who was doing the show, and I thought the show was terrible. And I said no, even though I could have used the money because it was that bad. <laughs> I, the show was never made. But um, over the years, um, we I would we would come across each other on panels or stuff like that. And then this opportunity came, and they were like, "You you want to see if you fit into the room?" And I was like, "Yeah, that's cool." And I came in there because it was like all people who worked on a wire, and I was the only new person. And I think I was coming in there just to give, like, consult. But then when they saw all of it, I had a file. They were like, you know, can you write an episode? And I was like, yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm up for the challenge. And I was, and I like the process because I don't really get an opportunity to be a student. You know what I mean? So I got a chance to watch how other people work. And then, and, and I got a chance to make sure um, we show as little humanity as possible when talking about police because... <laughs> that wasn't what the mission was. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad we got a chance to do that. That's what I, I was telling him. Like, you, all you got to do is be able to run a mile yeah. in like 48 minutes and, <laughs> and be like 22, no, and you could be a hero. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you said that on the, on the show, I was thinking like. America loves heroes. When I, was, I was walking through the airport one time with a fatigue jacket on, and this lady was like, Thank you. For, it was a couple. It was like, Thank you for your service. And I just looked at him like, You're welcome. Oh, just my like, God. <laughs> Well, by the way, speaking of policing, tomorrow the president is signing an executive order on policing. What is it? Is that the George Floyd bill? Or? Not, no, it's, oh. it's, it's his attempt to fill the gap from the lack of passage of the George Floyd bill. It's about use of force for federal officers. It's not going to, right. It's Joe Buttons, it's, no, it's, Bidens. <laughs> What'd you say? How about that? <laughs> that unless you, you in DC, unless you in okay. DC. That's a good point. That's a good point. That's a good point. That's a good point. This lady, the lady in green. Did you? Yes. Oh no. Oh. Oh. Okay. So I hate to bring this event to a close. But we are over time, and we still have books to sign. So I would love if everyone would give our guests a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dee, for this great event. And thank you, April, for still coming and moderating for thank us. You. you know politics and pros love you. I love y'all too. The lady, the lady at the other one thought I was crazy. I was like, where's everybody? <laughs> oh, my God. But thank hey, April, you, guys. Oh. Uh-oh. 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 Uh -oh. All right. We gotta get you on um, they are, at the Rio. Oh, yeah.